every every work of art will be some kind, you know, some combination of forces from of uh, information or force from the unconscious at play with or combined with or even at odds with some force from the conscious mind. Uh, when an artist tries to depict something, even then, if the artist is is doing something interesting, it's most likely through using some of the energy and some of the force that the artist has in his or her unconscious mind, along with the control and the knowledge and education and practice that is at work in the artist's conscious mind. important part of of you know why I do art is to be challenged and in in you know meeting that challenge of the moment working on whatever piece or type of artwork I'm working on um, to find a new solution to find something new from within myself that makes that piece I'm working on successful. But it's, 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 that, it's that challenge and discovery is what the real underlying motivation is. I was telling you before, if, if I had to do the same kind of art the same more or less way every day, it, would be, it, it wouldn't do it, it just wouldn't be interesting. done something what I like to do is show it to somebody and not say oh here's my picture of a goose or whatever you know here's his, you know I just show them the picture show them the piece and let them kind of experience it for a while and then uh, I like to get the person's reaction before I put anything else any talking any other suggestion into the mind of the person I like to get that viewer to give me the feedback, get what's coming out of the person after responding or in their response, in their ex response to experiencing the piece that I did. Well, I just immediately want to know if the board around it and the drop cloth are part of the piece. No, not this way. Okay. You know, there were things in my head that, that got sparked off by finding this piece of cardboard the 0 .060 virgin craft repeated across. Obviously repeated sort of endlessly and these are just chopped into the sizes that they are. And yeah, the word virgin has a cultural impact, you know, and so it, there's a power just right there. It's printed, you know, it's found, printed, vir mm -hmm. the zero, .060, zero, that opens up some questions for people. Mm -hmm. And then the word craft coming after virgin, craft, you know, craft with the C R A F T has meaning. Macaroni and cheese. But the yeah, the K R A F T. I mean, that's that's I mean, that's yeah. another very yeah. iconic cultural. I, I want to say image, but and and it, in essence, a word is an image, but it's a you know it's a very um, abstracted image. So, but yeah, the and then the combination of virgin craft the sound of it, the, the potential meanings of those two words together, you know, sort of went off in my head. The circular pattern of the pressed circles going on, I, I thought was interesting. Um, I don't really know what to make of the green around it. It doesn't, 
it's all over the piece. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the piece that brings the piece together, but it doesn't mean anything to me, except for maybe it's the one positive area for some reason. The green seems... Um, positive environment or something that you know it just well even though this is not a part of the piece i actually like it the drip the yeah, dripping yeah, it down yeah, to the yeah. floor mainly because this for me acts as some sort of like funnel mm. and then it continues to drip out onto the floor and because mm. that word virgin stands out to me i almost don't see those words mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i sort of just focus on this and you've got this circle mm -hmm. and the red and it's quite sexual mm -hmm. and then with the funnel and the leaking out it's the funnel shape is triangular shape here yes yes yeah yeah well no yeah, it's funny and I don't even read on. these lines as I now that you pointed out the triangle I see it but I didn't see it at first I wanted to use the mediums I found here in Dale's barn. This old paint from the old painter guy who used to live here before he lived here. Mm -hmm. A lot of it all dried out and ruined or having been frozen and kind of. And so I was, but I didn't know what condition I'd find it in. I, but I, I kind of had in mind to use the paint I found and be constricted that way. Okay. Everything that you used here are found things. So then I would just ask you, is that important to the piece or isn't it important to the piece? Mm -hmm. Well, it's important. It's not important specifically to this piece only. But just to you in general and yeah, the art that you do yeah, now. Yeah, a lot of the art I do, I, I for years, I, because I'm environmentally conscious, it kind of dry, it's been one of the driving forces in my wanting to do more art that doesn't use any material at all or material that's completely just found and in other words instantly recycled not new materials that's gone out and purchased, mm -hmm. and produced and purchased and use that way but you know, materials that are already there and don't, don't have to take up resources I, I just think unconsciously it kind of drove me to that I did a lot of artwork for a while when I was younger, and then I stopped doing artwork almost completely. Yeah. Um, but I went through about 20 years when I had, or more, when I had determined that I wasn't going to be an artist anymore. And a lot of it was just a conscious choice to not do art anymore, and that was sort of a response I had to, I don't know, to how I had fit into the world as an artist up to that point, and 
maybe just frustration. But it was definitely difficult to think and see as an artist and not produce any artwork. As much as I thought that should be my response to the world during that time to not produce art, that that was sort of my artistic response to the world I lived in was to be a, not, not to be an artist. In my head, I couldn't get away from it and it was frustrating. It was, it was almost painful. I mean, there were days where I would just be like, why am I not doing this painting? Some of the stuff I do nowadays, um, I, it wasn't something I was doing with this one that much, but some of the some of the stuff I'm doing nowadays, part of my intention is to paint or produce, depending on the, the medium I'm using, things that have at least some qualities, either compositional or textual or colors or some 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 combination of things that um, actually are unlikable or less likely to be liked by a viewer, um, less likely to be seen as being um, pretty or polished or and, you know, other artists have done done stuff that isn't pretty before. Um, it, it's, so, uh, yeah, it's not really a matter of prettiness maybe that I'm, that I'm getting to or, or rejecting prettiness as much as um, just trying to explore the question of what, whether it's important to like art or just to, uh, more important to somehow um, experience it, see it, experience it, even if it's unlikable. Well, the drippiness for me, for some reason, is sort of negative. Um, Even the drips down on the board that you were saying should be part of the piece? Yeah. Me <laughs> then, uh, okay. Because for me it's more like tears and blood and like this like oozing down. Mm -hmm. And for some reason the point oh six oh when I think about it reminds me of like the name of a gun or then like a kind of an engine so it has this like kind of powerful mm -hmm. quality to it. Mm -hmm. Um something mechanic and, mechanized or, or technical about yeah, it. Yeah, point oh six oh virgin craft. It's like this mm -hmm. Um, this go 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 with the circles. I mean, they're mm -hmm. sort of soft. They're not painted totally solid, but kind of this. The circles. Yeah, it's like you set something down mm -hmm. on it. Um, I don't. I don't know. And then this just sort of brought this all into, like I said, it's just funneling it all into one, one place. And that triangle is a little bit the shape of female, um, mm -hmm. the inside, and even the outside is sort of that mm -hmm. shape. I, I can't get it out of my head, uh, that uh, this theory I heard recently that some of the first artists, you, some of the first artists uh, might have been in 
prehistoric, tr more tribal days, caveman days, um, and that they might have been, you know, images might have been made, uh, or the first visual art might have been made by um, the shaman of tribes, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, through some combination possibly of uh, having gotten into trance-like states in our modern culture, you know, parallel to the ancient shaman, the few artists who connect spiritually somehow to, to bring something forth that isn't always there in us. They're able to produce work, produce thinking, produce images, and, and whether it's images or music or whatever, produce work that is uh, avant-garde or visionary. By, by showing people the power in art just as the shaman of prehistoric times would do, in many cases, people are going to be able to start having more appreciation and more interest in producing the art themselves. What I see as important is that the attitude towards artists is actually reduced from that of uh, deification or um, that fanaticism, the celebrity status, so that the, that wall is broken down and with more people at least making some attempts to produce work or to experience work that's, that, that has that same power, it will actually, in, in my ideal world at least, it will actually help people to be able to understand the artists who produce work that is more generally considered difficult to understand or accept. I think about visual art and art in general, music, whatever, in, in a very uh, multi-layered, multifaceted way, and uh, it's just as important to me in a way to be able to sometimes draw a portrait or a figure drawing or a landscape as it is to do work that's just purely what people call abstract, uh, what's more intuitive, more, more, more di directly or purely um, from the unconscious, um, and to do work that's more, uh, some of the things I'm thinking about these days uh, that are purely conceptual, that are very intellectual in a way, and not, not involving any craft 
like drawing or painting would, not involving much digging or opening up to the unconscious uh, or the emotions, but just sort of thinking about things. been out here maybe once, twice before that and hadn't really taken note of it and it was just the wall and then the one time it, the light bulb went off in my head it, I, I just saw it, saw it for you know how beautiful it is and realized it was just a big painting, it was just a huge painting. In the work I'm doing now where I find pieces that are what I would term literally finished or possibly in progress but in a state where I, where I find them in the moment that I do to be possessing of the qualities that I look for in artwork, that I look for in what people like to call abstract art. The piece has to have been either produced by or manipulated by people along the way over time, once or more than once, it seems like usually more than once, and usually also affected by natural forces, you know, nat natural er eroding forces like cold and sunlight and rain and wind and that type of thing. Um, and another important part of what makes this artwork for me is that none of these things were ever thought of as something that would be considered artwork when it was first put together by other, well, when it was first put together and ever worked on again afterwards. That big wall at the base of the lighthouse in Rockland, um, I'm willing to bet was never thought of as a painting by the people who went out there and whitewashed it over the years repeatedly. This work deals with artists, the, the craft necessary, how much craft is necessary in art to make it legitimate art. Um, who can be an artist or not? Can anybody be an artist or not? Um, and how much of being an artist is being able to just go out in the world and experience the world mentally and emotionally in ways that make it an artistic experience because that's basically what my work is now can you remove your ego completely your consciousness completely and your ego completely and still have something be called art that you you know be called your artwork there's a lot of resistance to that kind of uh, complete release of craft and manipulation. So whether I'm 
doing something that's realistic, that's a depiction, that's a you know, figure drawing, a portrait, a uh, landscape, uh, to whatever level of or percentage of that work is abstracted, let's say, uh, versus just an attempt at pure depiction. Although there's, I could debate somebody for a good long time on where the two meet when you talk about abstraction in art and uh, depiction, because depiction can't exist without abstraction. One of the qualities I'm looking for is to be able to remove a lockdown level of control from my consciousness so that it doesn't get in the way of something that's more intuitive, more spontaneous, something that's more, well, what I would call any, any number of things, something that's more spiritual, something that's more aesthetically beautiful even. But what I find is that these pieces, even more than many of the things that I worked on directly, where, and, and many of these things I worked on directly, I do feel were successful aesthetically, successful conceptually, and I was able to manipulate them in ways that produced successful artistic results in connecting to my unconscious and removing the, uh, the too tight control of the consciousness and getting that out of the way. Uh, but the pieces I'm finding will often contain aesthetic qualities that, in, that, that can be seen as even better, more well done than the pieces that I manipulated myself. I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't think there's an artist who ever lived who could recreate this effect in abstract painting. So here it is. It's been done. It's still being worked on. The, the point is, they, they, these things I find have some of the same aesthetic qualities as the work I produced myself, and I'm tuned to see that. Um, the When I'm given the piece that Sarah gave me that I call Sarah's Gift, there are qualities in that that I'm tuned to see by having done similar work myself. But it's important to make the distinction that that work, Sarah's Gift, or the Lighthouse Wall, often will have qualities that go beyond what I would be likely to come up with just by doing unconscious work on my own. So if you look at Sarah's gift, it's just a simple piece of paper board, mat board, that's been, it's been worked on and this is without any attempt by anybody to make it artwork. Um, you know, it was just a piece of board that was lying around in the print studio that got wet one day or something, more than likely. But now it has qualities of texture and a little color, and and it's not aesthetically pleasing in any classic sense to me, in 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 any kind of. Um, balanced geometry or um, lovely flow of line or shading or, or, or anything like that. But for me, it had the right combination of those aesthetic qualities combined with the right, being sort of in the right place at the right time as far as its having been formed as a man-made piece of, of material and then manipulated on further and then thought of, in this case, thought of by somebody who I have respect for as an artist as potentially being a work of art.
its connection to the accidental formation that it, it, that it underwent and to Sarah having found it afterwards and presenting it to me becomes part of what it is. And I like this one is depending on what's going on with the light and what's going on in my head on any given day all kinds of ideas and feelings and images can happen Part of my motivation for doing work like this, where I go out and find works that are already extant in the world, that are already, that I just deem to be artwork, but that in fact already exist without my buying more material or collecting materials or producing anything myself, is I, that I feel a... Uh, that in a, in a sense there's been enough that's been produced already. That there's, uh, if, if anything, we as a species today produce too much. It's an instant, it's a form of instant recycling. It doesn't bother, you know, it hasn't bothered me for a long time now that I might show something to somebody and, and that person will trash it. I mean, it's just like, you know, just totally tear it up. It doesn't bother me. I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying if that's all I ever heard, it would be easy to take. You know, I could, I could see there being some pain involved and always being trashed everywhere I went. But, um, but it doesn't really bother me. That's not, that's not. The fact that somebody, as a matter of fact, right now, the stuff I'm into right now, the stuff I'm really into, I'm basically finding resistance towards from almost everybody I know, and whether they're other artists or um, friends or whatever, you just, which is kind of what makes me really think I'm on the right track, I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> how much of being an artist is being able to just go out in the world and experience the world mentally and emotionally in ways that make it an artistic experience. 